All right, so um, let's start. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank everybody for joining us for our uh, fall lineup. Um, we have a really, really great uh, speaker today, which is Sean Willett, who will be talking about escarpments. Uh, and we also have a really great uh, speaker list coming up, as you can see here on our screen, on our shared screen. Um, make sure you check it out. It's, uh, the links are on our website, which is constantly updating with um, the talk headlines and abstracts. Um, also, uh, a bit different than what we usually do, we'll keep the chat open this time. So if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, they can write it up in the chat and we'll make sure Sean notices it. So um, feel free to ask along. And um, yeah, we'll also have, of course, uh, um, you, can, you can also keep your question and ask it at the end of the talk. Um, and with that, I think we'll uh, give Sean the stage. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen here. Is that correct screen? Okay, thanks. Well, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to see such a long list of familiar names. Sorry, I can't see you all in person. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to know you're all out there still, and uh, I'm happy to be able to communicate at least uh, through this now normal way with, uh, with, with all of you. So uh, let me also thank my, uh, my uh, uh, co-authors or co-contributors here. I'm going to present some work that was done in part in collaboration with Scott McCoy and Helen Beeson. And then in particular, my PhD student, Yan Yan Wang, who just completed her PhD last year at ETH. And uh, much of this talk, in fact, is her work. So with that, I'd like to jump in and talk a little bit about, if I can get my screen to advance, about nature's natural experiments. So as geologists, we're all sort of left at the mercy of nature because not being physicists, it's very difficult for us to do controlled experiments, at least not without scaling time and space down to, to rather uh, different values than we find in nature. So much of our work is, is left to the, to the mercy of, of nature's natural experiments. And I think the most common one for at least tectonic geomorphology is the uh, one on the screen here, U equals E which is rock uplift is equal to erosion rate. This is perhaps the most common of our uh, sort of natural experiments in nature. And this is in fact a, a, a simplification of, sorry, I'm uh, not able to control my screen I think because of all the people it being admitted as a convener, there we go. So, U equals E is a, is a simplification of the more general problem of, of, uh, of time-dependent uplift, where, where rock uplift is uh, minus erosion is fact equal to the change of a surface elevation. This is a problem that we're all quite familiar with. Uh, if we write this out in terms of an erosion law, for example, the stream power law here, uh, here in the bottom, this is then describing a, a time-dependent uh, uplift erosion problem, an example of which uh, we're probably all familiar with, uh, with landscape evolution models, a block of rock is uplifted, we watch the transient wave move through the system, and we end up with a, a, a simple case where the erosion rate has now self-organized itself in a way that it is now balancing the rock uplift at every point in the landscape. And the reason this works so well is because uh, this is a system that's dominated by negative feedbacks. And by that I mean that the erosion rate is, is a function of elevation or various metrics of elevation, particular relief, hill slope, channel slopes, et cetera, in a way that's generally increasing monotonically. Higher the slope, the higher the, the erosion rate. And it works in the other direction. The higher the erosion rate, we have the greater the lowering of the, of the surface is. We have a delta elevation that goes in this direction. Together, these define then a negative feedback and the system reaches an equilibrium. And this is what makes it such a nice problem that there are, of course, hundreds or thousands of papers that are, that are premised on, on this first principle, right? But there's a second experiment that I think uh, has been underappreciated that is almost as simple as, as uplift equals erosion. And that is the problem of a, of a retreat of an escarpment. And I'm going to mostly focus on, on what are referred to as passive margin escarpments, although in fact, the physics of this is general enough that I think this applies to escarpments, at least at, at relatively large scales. 
But I think that the common feature of these escarpments is that they're formed by a new base level. And in the case of a passive margin, of course, this is rifty. We form a new ocean basin, and there are examples here, but if we form a new ocean basin, uh, we have uplift of the surrounding area, and the uplift may vary depending on, on the tectonic processes. But what's most important for the geomorphology is that we have a new base level. We have a new ocean here, and that ocean is, is uh, presumably in the middle of what used to be a continent. So if we had a drainage network or, or other surface processes, they were not aware of this or were not equilibrated to this base level. And it's the formation of this, of this coastline here that then drives the formation of a new river system. And this forms a new escarpment with a water divide uh, somewhere in the middle of, of this old, uh, say, pre-breakup surface here as shown by this figure from Japson. So the result is that we, we end up building, a, a you know, at least in the case of passive margins, relatively large escarpment of relatively high relief. Pictures here on the right of, of two examples in Africa and, and India. We can have uh, one to more than two kilometers of relief. And this tends to be, a, in fact, a water divide. And I'm going to take that as sort of a first principle that these escarpments are, in fact, coincident with water divides that are separating an inland high plateau with a coastal plain that is at very low elevation with this uh, steep escarpment between the two. And if we take that sort of first principle and we make it as simple as we possibly can, then this, uh, uh, we, we can in fact treat it as, as, a, as a problem, very, very simple. Uh, we have to make a couple of assumptions. For example, there's no uplift no sediment storage, no slope on the coastal plain, and no erosion of the plateau. If I simplify it down to that, we end up with a situation like this, where we have essentially no erosion, uh, no uplift on each ends, and we have this transition, and the escarpment then becomes a, a, a transition between these two surfaces. In this case, there's only one scale to the problem, which is uh, this elevation of this plateau, or the height of the escarpment, ZP, and there is, in fact, no time dependence to this problem. Right? We can't tell where this escarpment is in space, if it's next to the coast or if it's way, you know, hundreds of kilometers inland, there is essentially no scale to this problem. And under those conditions, the system must in fact be characterized by a single parameter, which is then the retreat velocity of that escarpment. And this really just falls out of then of the scaling relationships between, uh, you know, between this, this relatively simple problem. There is again a positive feedback that simplifies this. That feedback is that the entire slope must retreat at the same rate. Otherwise, it either steepens to the waterfall state, which actually may happen in some cases, or it will simply flatten out and, and vanish and no longer be recognized as an escarpment. Is there a question? I see a, a chat comment. If not, I will continue then. So this problem then is uh, uh, can be if we if we then combine this uh, idea of a moving escarpment with a stream power incision, we can define a problem like this where we have then a simple case of a high plateau again. Maybe there's a hill slope transition. We have a disequilibrium fluvial river system or fluvial reach and some kind of a stable I refer to as an equilibrium fluvial relief, relief surface. This could be either a transport limited river or could be simply a effectively flat coastal plain. But this is then a, a, a disequilibrium problem. We have, uh, we can define our stream power channel incision along this section. If we assume uh, Hack's law, we can convert area to length. So this becomes just a one dimensional problem. Uh, but what we have then that defines the disequilibrium is we have a change in the domain size. This catchment, here's an example catchment like this, this catchment is growing with time. This water divide will be moving inward and it will be increasing uh, its uh, overall drainage area with time, even though the escarpment face itself may not increase in height, it's simply migrating inland. This simple problem uh, can be made even simpler by just recognizing that we can change the frame of reference of this problem. And if we put this in a frame of reference that's fixed to the escarpment, again, recognizing that we expect this escarpment is moving at a constant velocity, we simply transform the frame of reference into that velocity, by that velocity, so that the escarpment is then stationary in space in our reference frame. And in fact, the rock is then moving through this system uh, in the direction of the white, the white arrows. 
So the reference frame is now taken to be the divide and the rock is moving in the, in the opposite direction. In this case, that reframes this problem uh, in terms of, of an advection problem. There's an advective term. This is the velocity of the, of the rock now with respect to the, to the surface. And again, our uh, stream power incision law, but we've lost the time dependence. This is now a, even though the, the things are moving in time, there is no time dependence to this, uh, to the way we've expressed this problem now. It's now a steady state problem. So this then becomes our statement of, of our natural experiment. It's a very simple, it's almost as simple as U equals E, it's Vs equals E or negative Vs equals E, if you think of how you define the slope and the velocity. Right, and so again, we can write a differential equation in 1D for this very simple case. There is no time dependence to this problem. We have simply advection or this advective term is equal to the erosion term. And again, this could be done with different uh, uh, erosion laws. We can do this for a diffusive hill slope as well as, as uh, some combination of, of uh, different erosion laws if you'd like. But the point is that this term now has replaced the uplift in that very simple experiment that I described in the beginning. Well, this one, we can, uh, we can solve this problem then the same as an uplift problem. This is what we did in this, this paper a couple of years ago. Uh, we simply solved this problem. The solution for the river profiles looks very, very much like a U equals E problem. Uh, the difference is that we've now gained this extra slope term. So all of these terms end up with things like m over n minus one. And that includes also the scaling between slope and area. Uh, for the uplift problem, this of course scales with m over n. In this case, it's scaling with m over n minus one. So we've changed a little bit the, the expected scaling of this. We can also solve this in terms of the velocity of the escarpment. If we assume, a, in this case, a k and, and some other conditions, this becomes a function of the elevation of the plateau, if you'd like. Uh, and we can then solve, and of course, the, the, the usual parameters such as n, it's a very strong function of n, in fact. Uh, but we can then, with these assumptions, come up with, with some kind of a velocity. These, in this particular case, for these particular values of, of k, we found rates in the order of, of several millimeters per year for the, the rate of escarpment. This is from the, the Great Plains, uh, North America. So that was sort of the theory then and, the, and sort of where we were a couple of years ago. And, and uh, now I'm going to take this to the uh, to the passive margin escarpment problem. And this is again, the, the doctoral thesis of Yang and Wang, uh, who looked at the conjugate margins between Madagascar and India. So we'd like to use this as an example, both to test the theory that we came up with and, and to further check whether you know, the, the processes that we can observe and, and the rates and so on are, are consistent with, with some of these ideas, as well as perhaps learn something about the uh, geomorphic processes that are occurring at these passive margins. So this is uh, Madagascar, India. These are conjugate margins. The Indian Ocean formed in the Lake Cretaceous between, the, between these two uh, uh, fragments of Gondwana land. Uh, you can see the evidence of the, the rift and the rift escarpments very clear. These are the chi maps for the two. So the normalized distance uh, channel length of the river network on each of these uh, continents. And uh, you can see how asymmetric they are. This is the water divide, uh, Madagascar and India. They're very close to the, the rift margins, uh, especially India is extremely asymmetric in this regard. So this is defining, in fact, this, an, an escarpment along the, uh, this line of the continental uh, water divide along here and here. If we look first at the uh, Western Ghats in India, we can uh, have a look at some of the river profiles that are coming down out of the gaps. So again, here's the, the escarpment is very clear in the topography. The white line is the water divide along here. Uh, we'll pull out a couple of the rivers and look at the profiles uh, coming down out of the gaps. Uh, the black rivers are shown here on the left now, both as a, as a profile in distance and a profile in chi. And you can see that the morphology is, is matched very well. This is uh, you know, sort of as we predict, there you can see the coastal plain is extremely flat. Yes, there's a small gradient, it has to get sediment out, but it's a very low gradient on the coastal plain, whereas the escarpment is very clear and also very linear in chi space, suggesting that it has a relatively uniform erosion rate along, along that escarpment. So that part fits our, our concepts of, of you know, a retreating escarpment very well. Uh, however, there are other things that don't fit so well. 
So in particular, we can check our prediction that the concavity, that is the slope area scaling in these rivers should be quite different from what we normally see in a, in a tectonically uplifting area. This is the slope area plot for these same rivers, the black ones shown on the, on the map here. Well, actually, this is for a subset. This is for a single basin here on the left. But what you can see is that, uh, again, you can differentiate between the coastal plain and the escarpment very clearly. But the concavity here is about 0.4. And that's a, you know, a typical number for a tectonically uplifting area. And if, in fact, this should be scaling with m over n minus 1, we would expect a much larger value than 0.4 for this. So in fact, this is not fitting our theory very well. There's another problem that doesn't fit uh, very well. And that is these are the red rivers on the map at the right here. So these rivers, in fact, are differentiated from the black ones in that these all actually initiate somewhere up on the high plateau. And they, in fact, have a long, flat reach on the plateau before reaching the edge of the escarpment and dropping off steeply down to the coastal plain. And this shows up in the even stronger in the, in the chi plots. But uh, you can see these, these uh, in no way look like the kind of rivers that we said was our first assumption of, of a of a river that heads up against the escarpment with the water divide on the on the top of the escarpment. So it's clear that that uh, that these well these don't fit the very simple model anyway. Uh, there's two options here. Either these are the, the either the edge of the escarpment uh, is not a water divide through all of history and what we're seeing are rivers that have always been sourced back in the plateau and the escarpment is in fact a, a, just a big nick zone. Or the second option is these are, are river captures and that as the escarpment moves, it's, it's capturing large areas of, of the upper plateau. And some of this can be supported by looking at, at 2D models of this process. So here now we're looking at a landscape evolution model for a, a very simple escarpment retreat problem. There's an initial topography with a high plateau. Uh, and a uh, base level at a lower level on the left and on the right. There's no isostasy here. There's no flexure. There's just stream power erosion with diffusional hill slopes at the top. This is using the DAC model, which has a very accurate representation of the water divide. So we think we can track pretty confidently where river captures occur. And in fact, we see that, that yes, there are in fact quite a few large, uh, relatively large, at least significant river captures that are occurring as this uh, escarpment is moving inland. And you can see these uh, you know, in, in, in places that the rivers draining to the left are black, rivers to the right are white. So when it go, you see in many cases at any snapshot in time, there are black rivers that are in fact on top of the plateau. We can see this also by looking at the erosion rate, same model, but now plotting the uh, erosion rate instead of simply topography. And you see that, that in fact, the, the rivers will, in fact, capture areas up on the high plateau before uh, the escarpment actually arrives. The escarpment is, a, is however, well matched by, this, uh, by the erosion rate, which is focused along that escarpment surface. So what this is saying is that the, the 2D dynamics might be a little bit more complicated. We can look at this, uh, again, the same model now, but uh, take all of the nodes where we're making calculations on that model and project them onto a vertical plane, which is what you're seeing on the right here. Look at the elevation as a function of distance and the erosion rate as a function of distance. And you can, in fact, see then the, the, the migration of the escarpment and this zone of high erosion rates uh, as it moves from left to right across, across the model. And what's interesting here is we, if we calculate the average retreat rate, you of course have to sort of average things, but if we calculate the average retreat rate as a function of time, it actually stabilizes to a pretty constant value. So this part is in fact uh, matching what we predicted. There is, the retreat is at a constant velocity, uh, but the variance within any individual river reach could be very large. And keep in mind, because this is a perfect model, erosion rate is stream power, is channel steepness. These, these are equivalent quantities in this uh, model because it is a perfect model with uniform uh, materials. So the variance of any along the escarpment of the steepness, for example, is actually quite large. And this has to do with the, uh, these uh, captures, with the, with the river captures that are occurring along the, uh, the water divide as this moves forward. The other thing we can test from this 
is uh, this prediction of the dependence of the height of the plateau on the velocity. In fact, we find this works pretty well. If we run a whole series of these models and change the height of the, of the plateau, the high region, uh, we find that this retreat rate, this velocity that I was just tracking and I'm supposed to be still tracking, uh, is varying with the height of the plateau. So as the height increases, the, the velocity increases. So the scaling that we predicted initially uh, is in fact, uh, uh, seems to be holding. So if we sort of summarize, uh, I think what we're seeing from both empirical observations and models in 2D is that uh, some of what we were saying a couple of years ago is correct and some is probably not correct. First of all, what is right, uh, the erosion is definitely focusing on the escarpment phase. They are retreating at a constant velocity. That erosion rate uh, is spatially variable, meaning that the erosion rate is focused on the escarpment. Uh, and this retreat rate is scaling with the height of the, uh, of the plateau of the high region here. What is uh, not right is that there seems to be a problem with uh, this formulation of advection in that the 1D models don't seem to work particularly well in that there's no, a single specific reach of the river does not seem to be responding to advection in the same way. And this sort of uh, makes sense again if we think about what's going on with the in the two D models. Advection is a is a translational process. It it really represents the motion of the uh, of the of the surface with respect to the material underlying it, or vice versa. It's the motion of the material with respect to the surface. In a material reference frame like this red box, which is you know sort of fixed to the grid of the model. The rivers have no idea that they're, if they're moving or not with respect to the rock. In fact, they don't. The rivers are essentially locked to the rock. They don't know that in fact their boundary conditions are moving, which is what that, that advection is. And in fact, what the rivers say in this box or feel as this uh, wave moves through is they feel how much discharge there is. They're, they're feeling the motion of the divide and the change in discharge as that uh, divide jumps forward. And in addition, the, the, the way that we write these nice, simple uh, advection equations is actually probably not really correct in two dimensions again, because we're using different slopes. The slope of the, the, the advection is really the slope of the surface in the direction of the velocity. That is really a point right here in this direction, right? It's truly a horizontal line on this model, whereas this is the slope in the direction of the, of the flow of the water in a river. In 1D, those are the same. In 2D, these are no longer the same quantities. And I think this is kind of what's the, the problem is that it's, it's really not very appropriate to write these nice simple uh, equations for a, for a 2D problem. This is true also for the tectonic problem. So what I would say is that what's wrong in the way we formulated this problem earlier is that, that advection doesn't apply to specific reaches. These rivers are in a kind of perpetual disequilibrium due to this episodic river capture. So even though we can't, you know, we have some rivers where they're captured, some where not, somehow these average out over time so that at the end of the day, the escarpment is still retreating at a constant velocity. But this variance that we're seeing within the, uh, within the escarpment and within the, the river profiles is because of this rather sporadic uh, river capture that's occurring at the divide, which leads to this perpetual disequilibrium, but different states of disequilibrium, different timing for every specific river. So I think the, the uh, you know, what, what we've sort of learned from this is that we need to be a little bit careful how we formulate these problems. 1D models are probably not very effective at characterizing this. We need to think about how these processes are, are working in, uh, in, in two dimensions. So that's uh, brings us then to the next question then, or, or a next question, can we really measure this process uh, directly? So if we can't do this from theory, can, is there, are there some kind of empirical ways of measuring the actual velocity of retreat of these escarpments? And of course, uh, when we start talking about quantifying rates, we have to talk about uh, how we measure rate. And one of our main ways of measuring rate, at least erosion rates, is by using cosmogenic isotopes. 
And of course, there are data on uh, many escarpments. This, this is uh, two examples. The example on the, the right is a published study from the Western Ghats now. This is Mandel et al. 2015. On the left are new data, which, uh, we, uh, which we have obtained uh, as part of Yan Yan's thesis and are now in, in review or revision for uh, publication in GQ. So these are new data on the left from Madagascar. What we're seeing here are some of the lowest erosion rates ever measured. Uh, these are all these, if you can read the numbers, 34 meters per million years, 51 meters per million years. We're talking ones to tens of meters per million years. So these are extremely low erosion rates. And if we look particularly at Madagascar, where we have data on the plateau, so again, the black line here is, well, the escarpment runs more or less through here. All of these uh, catchments are on the plateau side of the, of the divide under 10 meters per million years erosion rates. So very slow rates. And as I pointed out at the beginning, this is not low relief terrain, right? This picture of the Madagascar escarpment here, the Western Ghats is a pretty major mountain range. Uh, the rivers are steep. And in fact, if we look uh, and compare these data that I was just showing you in terms of their uh, basin average erosion rate against the normalized steepness of these rivers, they're anomalous. They're sitting all out here. So the escarpment are the, the blue and the magenta colors. These are the escarpment data out here. So the rivers are relatively steep, but if we were to look at it and compare these to a, a tectonically active area that has rivers of the same steepness, the erosion rate is up to an order of magnitude smaller than we would find in any of these tectonic active, tectonically active areas. Now, maybe this is just a you know, rock type effect. Maybe this is the, the fact that tectonics actually changes the rock, the rock erodibility. But I think it has more to do with the way in which we're interpreting these cosmogenic data. And so I go back again to our, our basic concept here that, that in fact, when we're dealing with a, a, a catchment on an escarpment, we think that that escarpment is in fact my moving horizontally. Whereas the conventional way of interpreting cosmogenic data is that this is a fixed basin geometry and it's down cutting. And in fact, when we, we, what we actually measure with cosmogenic data is, the, uh, is a concentration. It's the concentration of beryllium-10 in quartz that's coming out of, this, uh, out of this catchment. That concentration is really the ratio of two quantities. It's a, a production, the point up here, this is the beryllium-10 production divided by the sediment production. So if we, if we take the production of beryllium-10 on the surface of our catchment, we integrate that over the surface, that could be, can be done in a way to give us just number of atoms of beryllium-10 in quartz. This is then diluted by the amount of sediment that's produced within that catchment, which is in fact the surface integral of the erosion rate of, the, uh, of, of this entire catchment. So that's a mass of beryllium divided by a volume of sediment or a volume of quartz, more specifically, that gives us a concentration, which is what we, we actually measure. And in fact, what we, what we really do then is we, we then back out the mean erosion rate for that catchment in terms of that, of that concentration. Well, that, that uh, concept can be generalized to think about this dilution process as being a, a flux again, or a ratio of two fluxes, but that flux does not have to be the vertical mean erosion rate of that catchment. We can think of this in terms of rock coming out of the earth into this catchment really from any, any direction. So the conventional view is that we, we take this uh, velocity of the rock, which is the erosion rate, which is vertical, we multiply, and we, we multiply it by the area, which is actually a projected area, right? Anytime you calculate a basin area, you're not actually calculating the surface area. You're typically calculating a, a projection of that surface down onto a horizontal plane. The, the sum of those, the product of those two is then a, a volume of rock. But if we think about this basin moving not vertically, but horizontally, then we can take that horizontal velocity and multiply it by a projected area of that basin, in this case now projected onto a vertical face, a vertical plane, and those two will also give us a volume of rock. So this, uh, this then is a, a you know, either, either we can think of this as a conversion from a vertical 
erosion to a horizontal erosion, or it could even be a generalization to a, to a, a flux of rock in any direction. Now, with the trouble, one trouble with the horizontal flux is that uh, we need to pick a direction. And that's why this basin is spinning in space here, because we don't actually know uh, which direction that, that basin might be moving horizontally. Uh, and so, in fact, we, we need to pick a direction in order to calculate this, uh, this area, this projected area onto the vertical plane. The easiest way to do this, we decided, was, uh, was in fact just to calculate it in all directions or at least in all directions over some reasonable range of potential values. It's not too hard to calculation to do. So if we do that, we can, we can uh, uh, pick a direction, calculate a, uh, a velocity and plot that on this radial plot so that these, uh, you, can see, you can see better down here, these are all vectors giving where the azimuth is giving the direction of the projection of the area and the length of that vector is now giving a velocity. So these are two basins. These are from the Western Ghats, these uh, where we have beryllium 10 concentrations. Those concentrations suggest an average erosion rate of 53 and 40 meters per million years, respectively, for these two basins. If we then pick a direction and calculate what that horizontal velocity would be, we get 540 or 1,070 meters per million years. So this is the same concentration of beryllium 10 We've simply changed the way in which we're going to we process that uh, uh, those data in order to calculate a, a number for what is now a horizontal velocity or a retreat rate of that of that escarpment, and this number is a lot bigger than that number. So, and this uh, sort of gives a certainly to me anyway a different view of this landscape. This is not a, a you know a, a stagnant passive landscape that's largely finished its erosion is eroding at this uh, you know, ridiculously small number. This is an active landscape. It's simply that it's, it's retreating horizontally into the land, into this highland adjacent to it rather than cutting down. And that rate is pretty significant. A kilometer per million years, that's an active landscape. And that's why these, these are essentially mountains, the rivers are steep. Uh, you know, this is suggesting active geomorphic processes, not, not these uh, uh, passive uh, processes that these very small numbers suggest. Incidentally, this number is not wrong, right? This is the mean vertical erosion rate for that catchment. It's just that it's averaging all of these areas where nothing is happening. The action is all happening along these, uh, these steep faces that are in fact driving that, that, that horizontal motion. So these two numbers are, are are internally self-consistent, they're both correct, they're just different ways of thinking about the landscape. If we uh, then do this for our two data sets from Madagascar and India, this is a summary then of, of, of what we get. We've, we've, we've reduced these to a common direction. So we've assumed that the mean horizontal retreat direction is uh, perpendicular to the coastline, which uh, also happens to track the water divide pretty well. And so if we take that common direction and convert all the beryllium 10 concentrations into velocities, this is what we get. In India, they're uh, going up to about 1200 or so, a little maybe 1500 is maybe the maximum number. That's meters per million years of retreat rate, a little bit higher on the Madagascar side where we get over, over two kilometers per million years. But we get uh, numbers that are all on the order of 100 to 1000 meters per million years. We see other uh, evidence that this, these numbers kind of make sense. They're correlated with the current distance of the escarpment from the, from the coastlines. You see particularly these big embayments have actually higher rates uh, than surrounding areas, which suggests that this is a long-lived feature. Uh, and this has been moving at a, at a higher rate than, than uh, on the surrounding sides. We can also compare this to the, uh, these numbers to the distance from the coastline, assuming that this escarpment has moved in from the coast since the uh, time of rifting. And these numbers are not too far off. Uh, again, if we look then at the, at the beryllium 10 based retreat right here, we compare that then to the distance to the coastline for each of these, uh, for the escarpment along here. Uh, this is looking again at the, at the combination of both Madagascar and Western Ghats. Uh, we have to pick a time of rifting, which is actually not simple. Uh, there's different, so we're not really sure when, uh, when the rift escarpment started as a morphological feature. It was certainly earlier than the rifting itself, 
and, and so here are the oldest prawn in the Indian Ocean is about 84 million years ago, but there's evidence for uh, both extension and dike intrusion as early as almost 100, 100 million years ago. And it could be argued that the rifting here started as much as 120, 120 million years ago when, the, when Madagascar, Africa stopped rifting and the, uh, the relative motion jumped outward of Madagascar between India and Madagascar. So it's probably closer to these numbers than these numbers, which are the curves up here, which in fact are, are, are at least, you know, this, if not, if not you know, when, don't want to argue that these are that this is perfect, but that it is of the same order of magnitude, and, and it's actually better than a factor of two for a constant rate since the time of rifting to bring that escarpment to, the, to where it is today. So the beryllium ten rates, which are of course a completely different time scale, are more or less consistent with this overall uh, uh, rate of of uh, migration since rifting. So one. More question that I'd like to come back to then and ask about this is, okay, if this is our, our, our view of, uh, of these escarpments, they're moving relatively quickly at a near constant rate for, for since rifting, uh, but there seems to be a, an important uh, control uh, by river captures from the plateau into the escarpment. And so we'd like to try to get a little bit better at how frequent are these captures? Uh, what are the processes? What is the geometry of the capture? How is this process happening? So ultimately, we, I don't think we have an answer yet, but ultimately I expect it's the frequency of these capture events that's actually uh, much of the control on the rate of this, uh, of this escarpment retreat. So I want to look a little bit at this, uh, analyze this problem a little bit more. Uh, start by looking at this uh, figure. Madagascar actually has a lot uh, fewer points where the escarpment is really along the, the water divide. So this is southern Madagascar here. I don't have a good location map, but southern Madagascar. The escarpment shows up nicely in, say, a river steepness map. So this is just a KSN map normalized river steepness uh, for the whole, for, for segments of the whole region. You can see the band here that represents the escarpment in magenta, the water divide is in white. So this gap between the two presumably has something to do with, with river capture or it's, or it's something else completely. There's a big river capture event down here, which I'll come back to at the end of the talk here, but all of these, uh, these are all pretty, you know, look at the scale here. These are pretty big areas. So a lot of this is, uh, is, is area that's now draining to this coast, but if this has been captured, it's really a lot of area. And it's a bit of a, bit of a surprise to me how much area there is here up on the plateau that is still draining to the, over the escarpment. So we try to quantify this a little bit. Here's, uh, we'll go back to the Western Ghats first. So what we've done here is look at the river profiles, all of the major rivers that are coming down from the escarpment. And we've split those into two types, A and B. A are really terminating up against the water divide on the top of the escarpment. So these are the nice simple ones that uh, I showed you in black at the beginning of the talk with kind of a linear segment in, in chi space here, uh, straight down to the coast or down to the coastal plain and then out to the coast. Type B have a segment of plateau up on the top. And particularly you see these, because Kai tends to exaggerate the small drainage area parts of the basin, these end up looking very large in Kai space in particular. So these we think are potentially uh, river captures then, and, and these are, are, are not, these are more the, 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 the phase of simple divide migration. Frequency along uh, the gaps are shown here. So type A, uh, probably 70% or so, are, or even 80% are, are uh, these uh, simple type and type B, the ones that have plateau area are, are the remaining here. Number of them are indeterminate, it's just too hard to tell if these are really capturing area or not. Madagascar is uh, uh, same analysis. Again, we can split into uh, type A, type B. Madagascar is a little complicated in that there are segments where there are big neck points uh, within the uh, the lower reaches of the river, that's what you're seeing here, but these are cases where the upper most reach is really steep going right up to the water divide. Type B then has uh, some kind of a, a low steepness reach on the top. Here there are more, that's more like about 40% are, are uh, type B. Incidentally, the colors here are uh, differentiating by latitude. So we're trying to see if there's any spatial generalizations. So there's one area where, where they're 
uh, you know, all type A and another where they're all type B. That does not seem to be the case. Uh, they're, they're really intermixed, including within the same drainage basin where there'll be uh, you know, some tributaries that are type A and some that are type B and they have a common confluence downstream. So you know, it's, which you can see uh, also in things like these, these chi plots, they, there's just no stacking. Putting these in chi space is not stacking these, which would be consistent with say a, a differential uplift history, but a constant geometry to the drainage basin with time. So uh, again, to me, this is sort of surprising just how many of these there are. I mean. River captures are cool. I like river captures, but I don't. I don't know why there'd be so many. This really, to me, this seems like there's there's just too many that they can't be happening kind of every day. And and that almost does seem to be the observation here that this is uh, uh, happening a lot more frequently than than say would happen in a, in a numerical model where we're trying to just look at divide migration. And I think in the end, we've, we, we, we think we probably know why. We think this is probably true, but it has a cause. And the reason why is because the, these plateaus weather. And these are, in fact, they weather a lot. Uh, both Madagascar and India are zones where there's a, a lot of rain. They're old. They're not eroding, right? And in part, they're not eroding because the escarpment is stealing the drainage area from the upper parts of these catchments. So the erosion rates are very low. There's enough rain that we're getting enough infiltration and weathering of these high plateaus. And, and you can see that this is an example from Madagascar the, uh, where erosion does occur. You get things like these lavacas, or these, the, which are these badlands that are forming in the, uh, you know, in this highly weathered material and in, in, in the plateau region of Madagascar. And you can see how, how thick this, this weathered zone is. We can also see that in things like, like uh, sediment weathering indices. This is, this is CIW of the river sediment uh, from a, a huge survey that was done in Madagascar by the, by the Chinese Geological Survey, kind enough to give us their data. Uh, we looked at this, you can see very clearly that this weathering is occurring in the coastal plain and it's occurring up in the high plateau and it's not occurring to the same degree along the escarpment, which is consistent with the higher erosion rates that we think are going on here. But it is highly weathered in both of, of, the, of these regions. And this we think is quite important because if uh, in fact we have up to you know, even hundred meters of, of weathered material uh, sitting on top of this escarpment, that changes the dynamics of this escarpment migration process. So if this is erodible material, even though this is a simple 1D model of, of you know, stream power with two erodibilities, having a weak layer along the, the, the upper plateau allows that water divide to race ahead of the escarpment. So water divides the circle, triangle is the, the true escarpment, and you can see that this can race ahead quite, quite rapidly. And if that's happening, that also then gives us the opportunity to, uh, to make uh, captures, lateral captures of the tributaries that would then be uh, you know, flowing in uh, roughly parallel to the escarpment. This is essentially the process of, of headward extension. Uh, you know, this is really uh, Davis's model for, for how uh, river capture in Pennsylvania was occurring for that matter, right? Is that this is really a reversal of one river, right? So this is the headward extension of one catchment. We're going, you know, in time here, for example, this is migrating inland, but as this uh, uh, river is migrating inland and it could be going very fast due to this regolith, it will capture then these lateral tributaries one by one until the, uh, in fact, forming the you know, kind of fish hook uh, uh, tributaries uh, th that uh, are now flowing down in this direction, but it will, will allow the then capture this relatively large area by reversal of the, of the trunk river. And we, would, we think that this, this weathered regolith layer in the upper surface then allows that to occur quite quickly. And just point out, this is very similar to the model then by Harrell et al. a couple of years ago in geology, where they argued that this is exactly what's happening uh, due to soft alluvial fill in a valley that was flowing in the other direction. That soft material allows the water divide to essentially race ahead of the escarpment. Uh, we think this is the same thing that's happening in Madagascar and India, but it's happening on a, on a much larger scale uh, with, uh, because of this uh, pervasive weathering layer on the upper surface without any need even for the alluvial fill. So to, to show, in fact, how that works, 
on a, uh, we'll put this into our, our landscape evolution model. So here's the same escarpment retreat model that I was showing earlier, but now we've added uh, a few tens, maybe a hundred meters of uh, soft material on uh, soft meaning a uh, more fluvially erodible material onto the plateau surface. And we're watching that, uh, the retreat of the escarpment. And what you're seeing is, is, are a number of these flashes of, of erosion that are zipping across the plateau here. Those are all uh, reversal events. That's where the headward extension of the Escarpment River is now racing ahead and removing the, the easily erodible material, reversing the flow direction of one of these valleys and capturing all of the lateral tributaries into, uh, to provide more drainage area to the escarpment. The escarpment then is eroding uh, faster due to this increase in area, but it of course is still following behind the, the advance of, the, uh, of, of this regolith eroding wave that's, that's out in front of the system. So finally, let me sh show you an example of where we think this is happening in Madagascar, where we think we can track that, and that's this large ca capture event down in, in uh, southern, uh, uh, southern Madagascar, this is the Mananara River. Uh, this is a big area, again, note the scale. This is hundreds of, kilom uh, hundred, hundreds of kilometers of channel length along here uh, and a number of uh, tributaries that are also in the hundreds of kilometers long. So the water divide, again, the white line here, we're looking at the oblique view. Water divide is coming through here. The escarpment is coming across here, roughly along the green line. So all of this area up in here, we would argue has been captured over the escarpment is now coming down to the, the Indian Ocean here. So this segment from here to what would be the wind gap along right here has been reversed and it was progressively reversed by erosion back up here. And each time it got to one of these tributaries, that tributary would have been captured and is now flowing down into the, uh, down over the escarpment like this. And you can see these you know, beautiful fish hook tributaries now where the, where they where, where these where precisely that process has happened and these formerly went out to the to the west they're now making these hard bends and coming down to the to the east down to the Indian Ocean all of this can happen with in fact very little erosion if we look again the same uh, basin the same the same uh, catchment uh, look at the river profiles in black here is what we would argue would be the reverse reach the the, the uh, tributaries that are that are captured are shown in the various colors. All of this is happening within 150 meters. So this is the elevation of the wind gap. There's almost certainly been some erosion of the edge of the escarpment here. So we would argue that that probably you know with maybe 200 meters of elevation here, you could have had a river that was flowing off down to the west. We all we've had to do is remove uh, 150 to 200 meters of material at the lip of the escarpment. And that would result in reversing this, uh, uh, this black reach and uh, for, again, 200 kilometers or more and capture of all of these uh, tributaries. So let me wrap it up with a number of conclusions. Uh, escarpments do represent a simple landscape experiment represented by divide migration across the landscape, maybe not as simple as I might have thought a couple of years ago even. Uh, but this retreat rate does tend to go to a steady rate. It's measurable with uh, cosmogenic isotope concentrations. And, and I, I think we're quite pleased that we're actually able to measure this, we think fairly accurately. Uh, in our study, we found retreat rates uh, pro, uh, you know, up to about a kilometer per million years. So these are pretty active uh, rates of landscape change. We have to be careful again, how we model this. I'm not sure these models of advection and a single reach are, are, are correct, but at the escarpment scale, this is the process, this advective process is what's occurring. It's something that is accompanied with episodic river capture, which is accelerating that, that uh, migration rate. And this process itself is accelerated by weathering of these surfaces, at least in places like Madagascar. And I will stop there and take questions. Thanks very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Sean, for this really, really interesting uh, and amazing talk. Um, so our chat is open for questions, has been, and you can also raise your hand and we will unmute you if you want to ask any questions. So uh, go ahead. Perhaps I can stop. 
with the question. Mm -hmm. So, so as far as I understand, the models you do have no isostasy in them. How sensitive would these uh, escarpment captures be to isostasy that I expect would be have the highest amplitude just at the escarpment? Uh, that's correct. Um, and in fact, in the in the paper describing this, we've put in an isostatic correction. We've tried to calculate that to figure out what it does. Uh, I can't say too much about the captures, but I can say is how much it affects the, say the brilliant 10 estimates of the rate of retreat, which, which uh, uh, is what we sort of corrected for. Uh, I think it probably is not that large because you have to keep in mind that the height of the escarpment is already isostatically corrected, right? I mean, it is already isostatically uplifted. If this is a steady process, the isostasy you know, from the previous erosion has already uplifted the, the lip of the escarpment so that you know, it's not really going to increase the uh, uh, elevation or the slope of the escarpment by very much, right? So if we look at the you follow what I'm saying? It's, you know, think of this isostatic uplift as kind of a wave that's moving with the escarpment. It's already got there. The wave is already there. So what we're seeing is the topography after the isostatic uplift. So the next increment of erosion is not going to be very much. And since there's not a steep slope dipping off to the plateau side, I think that won't develop due to isostasy. All right, thanks. Okay, so we have uh, our first question from Ellen Howard. The capture rate should depend strongly on the address gradient of the upland. Well, I guess it's more of a comment than a question. Um, would you like to respond, John? So, uh, I'm not sure I'm following the gradient, meaning the gradient uh, of the plateau surface in the opposite direction. Alan, perhaps you'd like to explain. We can also unmute you. All right, so maybe we'll um, we'll hang on a bit. Um, oh, well, and uh, I can sort of try to guess and comment in general. I mean, it's going to depend on a lot of things. It's going to depend on the also the pre-existing river network. So you know, if, if it's running really parallel to the to the escarpment, for example, you're going to get more larger catchments captures, of course. Uh, but I think a lot, I think it in many ways depends more on the thickness of the erodible layer, if we're correct that there is this, right? Because that's what allows that reversal to occur, you know, uh, quite quickly, right? That if you can cut through, a, if it, you know, if, if, if the reverse slope of the old river is, you know, only, you know, 10 meters over 100 kilometers, and you've got 20 meters of uh, regolith to erode, then it's very easy to reverse that gradient. All right. Um, well, we have somebody raising their hand, so um, I'll unmute them. Go ahead. Uh, Fish hi. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Vishwas Kale. I'm from India. And my question is regarding your model that why do you assume that the streams uh, which are retreating uh, headward, the coastal streams, uh, and the uh, rate of retreat of these uh, stream heads and the sparse, the interflows in between, should be retreating at the same rate? Uh, well, the interflows are a good point because of course uh, the interfluves probably don't retreat at the same rate, uh, but the, but the interfluves uh, or, you know, in particular where they become detached and form detached buttes, for example, which is very common in these settings, right? These really represent little bits of the landscape that were inefficiently eroded by the escarpment when it passed through. Right? And, and they don't retreat. The, you know, a butte will not be moving, a, a butte can't possibly be moving horizontally, right? It's just being downcut in place. Uh, the, the, the problem is, you know, what effect does that have on say brilliant 10 concentrations? Because then we have an eroding body in the middle of our catchment that we did not account for. And uh, this was, we were worried about this initially quite a bit, but in, in fact, in the end, I think it ends up being much like landslides in a mountain catchment, they're anomalies. They're clearly creating an error, but they're an anomaly that's countered by 
some other anomaly on the face of the escarpment. So if, for example, we're picking up excess sediment from an eroding butte, there's another part of the escarpment face that is eroding slower than it should be, which is why you form buttes in the first place. And these effects tend to cancel. So in the end, we end up uh, averaging these erosion rates and, and coming up with a number that seems to be pretty good. Which, uh, you know, maybe it's surprising, but this is the same thing that uh, you know, we all thought about in terms of landslides and mountain catchments 10 or 20 years ago, you know, that they should completely ruin a really intent measurement and they don't you know, because they do tend to average out. And I think things like interfluve topography, buttes and so on are the same sort of thing. Somehow they just average out and we get a number that seems to make sense. Uh, another point is uh, you have assumed that the streams flowing over the plateau and towards the ocean, they are uh, diametrically, they are flowing in diametrically opposite direction, which is not uh, really the case. There are many streams which are perpendicular or at uh, angles, and those which are uh, perpendicular over the plateau, those are the ones that get captured oh, I, more I frequently. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I mean, that's why, you know, I mean, I think this example in Madagascar shows that beautifully. These, these tributaries are not running perpendicular to the escarpment, right? That's why they end up being captured and forming these dog lakes, right? They're forming oblique to the escarpment. Uh, you can see the same rivers here or here. They're all running roughly obliquely uh, and, and would have joined up with what we call former river here, right? There's no question, and, that, and I'm sure it's that geometry that leads to the large captures. Okay, so we have a next comment in the chat or a question, but I have to say, I don't totally understand the question. <laughs> so I, have put us, I I'm gonna read it out to um, Sean, but maybe you can, if you're okay with it, unmute yourself and explain a bit better what you actually um, want, is, is that okay? Um, so I'm just going to read it out um, for now. Um, Palgat Gap, 60 kilometer break in Western Ghats. Can we attribute an origin for this region as mentioned in case of Madagascar? Uh, yeah, I, I'm familiar with the gap, so I know I do know what you're referring to. Um, that's probably, it could be, that, you know, that that's something like what we're seeing in this picture in Madagascar, that for some reason the escarpment has moved much faster. There is essentially no escarpment. The water divide is uh, quite far inland in this case. Uh, it also has the uh, youngest thermochronometry ages in the Western Ghats, so it's clear there's been more erosion in that area. Uh, besides that, I don't know, but it's very possible that it was because of some event like this that caused the escarpment to move much faster there than uh, in the surrounding areas. Okay, I think we have another uh, hand uh, raised. I'll try to unmute, ask, yeah? Are you uh, yes. please welcome and uh, answer your question or ask a uh, question? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Narayana again from India. It was a nice talk quoting the example from the Western parts of Villa. <coughs> Villa. Uh, is it really the escarpment retreatment or simply the removal of the material since the formation of the Western Cards? Is it to basically the discussion had come some 15 years ago whether the retreat of the escarpment can be used in this world or not? First of all, that is one, one question from my side. And the other one in your model, you have mostly looked into the tectonic aspects and the erosional rates and all that. But how much input that you have given into your model about the climatic conditions? Because the climate also plays an important role in the erosion of the materials particularly along the west, west coast or western parts of India? Uh, we have not done anything with changing climate to answer the second part first. Uh, so yeah, if there, uh, and we've not investigated potential for changing climate, uh, which I appreciate could be important. Uh, and the fact that we are getting roughly the same average rate over 
since the Cretaceous versus the modern might be coincidence or it could be an error that we're because we have not taken into account any any changing climate and of course the sediment supply in the offshore suggests that it may have changed. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get your first question. Yeah, the word using the escarpment retreatment, how appropriate that is because it is simply the since the formation of the Western Ghats, it is only removal of the material, the erosion and removal of the material and being transported. So whether this word to use the retreatment is appropriate or not, because this was discussed earlier some 15 years ago when some in one of the workshops in India, Bangalore, where Peter Molnar, Susan Anderson, Bob Anderson attended that workshop along with Professor Kale, Vishwas Kale, my other colleague who spoke. So how Well, I don't know. You'd have to. I'd have to go through the. If it's a rhetorical question, I'd have to go through the rhetorical arguments. But uh, I, I think it's a, a good description of the physical processes that's occurring. You know, it's it's. A, of course, it is erosion. You get retreat by differential erosion and removal of material. That's certainly happening. I, I think the you know the important question is what best describes the physical processes, and I think it is the motion of the water divide and the escarpment is the dominant process here, and I like the term. Okay, nice, thank you. Good, okay, we have a few more questions in the chat. So from Kai Deng, um, he writes, thank you for the fascinating talk. I have one question. Since the plateau of this landscape has been weathered for a long time with low erosion rates, and then suddenly experiences uh, the high erosion rate, the rock strength may be very low, um, so should the erosion rate or retreat rate in this case be even higher compared to other mountain belts at the same steepness? Yeah, I think it, I think it almost certainly is. And that's certainly the, the argument we're using in the numerical model and the weathering. The problem is that the, the, the weather material is probably removed so fast, we'll never really be able to measure that. Uh, and, and it's also happening in a very localized area where it's very difficult, say, to get a, a meaningful Brilliant 10 uh, measurement because the drainage area is just too small. So what we end up measuring with the Brilliant 10 is a mix of the, the hard rock erosion because you'll, you'll cut through this weathered material very quickly and hit the hard rock. Uh, and so you'll end up with you know, a mix of the low erosion rates and the high erosion rates. But almost certainly, yes, that's the whole idea is that it's more erodible and the, the, the steepness would not be comparable uh, to those erosion rates in other mountain belts. On the other hand, the, you know, the, the data that I showed on the steepness is for the escarpment, so that's in the hard rock. That's not in the regolith uh, or the weathered material that we, we think is triggering the capture events. Just a follow-up question. Do you actually see that the, this removal of regolith would um, sort of form a lower level Plateau? Uh, well, it, it could, and I, we haven't done enough work, but that's sort of what we're starting to see, you know, with things like this. So if we're correct, this, this entire reach here is reversed, but you see there's also another nick point here, for example, which suggests that maybe uh, when the, say the blue tributary was captured, maybe there was some time at which it was eroding down, it was really down cutting that plateau. Uh, before it started capturing the others. And so we end up with a, a second nick point in here. But certainly now this river is probably running on bedrock, not on, not on weathered material, right? After at least in the lower parts up here, we don't know, right? So yeah, there will be now be a kind of a mix of down cutting and back cutting of the escarpment for some period of time. Yeah, I, I'll also, um, I wanna ask a question in that in in this area, which is what do you think will happen in areas where the weathering is much slower? So I don't know where where not just erosion rate, but um, the the we actually see slow weathering. Well, I, I, of course, that's an important question. Uh, I I would guess um, we haven't tested, but I would guess that means fewer river captures, and and uh, right because if you don't get this advancing. Uh, you know, the divide racing ahead of the escarpment and only the escarpment is going to move slower. And the one thing we I didn't show, but we we have tested or at least observed that the 
erosion rates go up when the plateau area that's been captured goes up. So, I'm, and again, we haven't done enough work yet, but I am pretty sure that we'll find that the escarpment retreat rate is linked to the frequency and size of river capture events. So you're going to get a cascade. If there's no weathering, there's smaller captures, the escarpment itself will move slower. So, you know, it could be, you could even argue that the weathering rate or the weathering degree is ultimately going to control how fast that escarpment is migrating. Okay, thanks. Um, the next question in the chat is from David Kelly, who is curious about how much field work your research actually involved versus aerial photo interpretation. For example, determining weathering rates or the degree of weathering probably involves some field work, as does the dating of exposed surfaces. And um, a second question, is wind erosion a significant factor in increasingly weathered surfaces relative to stream or water erosion? Uh, well, the first part, I'll embarrassingly say that we've never been to Madagascar. <laughs> uh, even the, even the uh, samples for the Brilliant 10 and for the, uh, the sediment weathering were collected by the Chinese Geological Survey, who gave us all of their samples. So uh, uh, it involved no field work whatsoever. It's only DEM analysis and, uh, and sampling, but other people doing the sampling for us. The last uh, part, uh, the wind erosion, Oh, no idea. I, I, should, I wouldn't even speculate. I mean, the, the, uh, certainly these high uneroded surfaces are going to be affected by things like wind erosion. But I mean, I, I'm, I'm impressed with the recent work on, uh, on dating laterites in places like Madagascar and Brazil and uh, uh, Western Africa and so on that, that are finding extremely old weathering, you know, Eocene, I don't think we've seen Cretaceous, but we're seeing, you know, tens of millions of years on the, the age of these lateritic uh, surfaces and sediments that are up there. So it's very, it's clear there's parts of these landscapes that are not eroding really at all. Okay, so um, if you talked about uh, Brazil, we'll move on to a question by Nel Nelson Fernandez, uh, who says in southeastern Brazil, we see similar features in Sierra do Mar. But here, the main control for the location of these areas, higher retreat rates of the escarpment, seems to be related to the orientation of foliation and fractures in the bedrock, parallel and perpendicular to the escarpment, respectively. How can we include these effects in the DAC model? I, I'm sure you're right. I, I believe you. I'm not sure that. I mean, we, could, you know, we can always build these kinds of things into numerical models, but I think we've got so many other problems with numerical models that they're, they're most effective at, gen, at illustrating general processes rather than trying to uh, uh, simulate every detail of every, every particular study area. But, uh, but I agree, there's some very interesting effects with things like bedrock uh, fabrics affecting rates and directions. Uh, we see this in Madagascar with the rivers actually, you know, doing things like changing direction to follow foliations and things like that. So it's there, we could try to build those things in, but uh, I think there are bigger problems in our models than that right now. All right, uh, let's go for the next question. Uh, David Litwin writes, some studies have found that highly weathered uh, relict surfaces in the Western US Sierras and Puerto Rico remain in a kind of stalled condition because of a lack of sediment tools to do erosion. Do you think that kind of effect isn't happening here? And if so, why might that be? Uh, I don't know that it's not happening. Maybe it is happening. It's, it's possible to say we, you know, we, we haven't got every detail worked out in, in any of these areas. We have no field work in this area. We now have a new project starting here. So we hopefully will be in the field in Madagascar. Uh, but it could, it could well be. I mean, certainly what we do see that suggests that it's not happening, as I mentioned earlier, we see a correlation between the Brilliant 10 based retreat rate and the uh, drainage area of the plateau currently going over the escarpment. So if we capture more area, the erosion rate does seem to increase which suggests that there are in fact tools uh, working here. The scale here might be larger uh, than, the, than, the, than the, some of the studies that you're referring to there uh, as well. It may be that there's simply enough uh, area and enough bedrock exposed that there are enough tools coming down from these areas as well. 
Yes, I might just use the opportunity and ask a question here myself because it kind of relates to what you were just talking about. Um, so in the middle part of your talk, you were discussing how you um, basically translated 10 volume concentration into different rates, so either vertical or horizontally, and they were quite different from one another. So if you would turn them into volumes, they would also be quite different. And I was wondering if there have been, okay, so maybe they're not no, in fact, okay. In fact, uh, in fact uh, the volumes are equal. The volumes of rock removed are equal. Okay, then that's, this that's kind of kind answers of the already the question because I was I was okay. wondering um, if you've compared your ten volume data to other other data sets like maybe sediment yield or sediment accumulation rates um, offshore or something uh, no, to get no, an idea no, about no. total volumes that have been eroded. Right. Yeah. We have not done that. It would be a good idea to do that. But, uh, but yeah. But just to say again, in fact, that the the volume of Rock removed is equal whether it's vertical or horizontal. That's kind of the that's kind of the, the principle that what we're what the brilliant ten concentration constrains is exactly that it constrains the volume of rock that is exiting that particular basin. It does not constrain the direction of which that rock or the spatial distribution of where it's coming to the surface. Okay, something to think about. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, then I'm just going to move to the next question in the chat, which is more of a comment, I would say, and it refers to another publication from 2020 by Jean et al, if it's French, um, on the basis of dating um, uh, of coastal and plateau laterates infer that the get scarp has been stable for the last 45 million years. So. Maybe you want to comment on this? Uh, I'm trying to remember if that's the paper I'm familiar with. I've seen, uh, um, I think I read that one. I, there, I know I've looked at most of the dating, uh, the lateritic dating uh, papers, and I, I'm not sure I agree with the conclusion. I, I agree with the dating and the data, but there's enough uh, room to allow the escarpment to continue to move uh, over over this time frame, right? That it's it's difficult to well, let's let me put it this way: the coastal laterites that would provide the constraint on when the escarpment uh, passed through are far enough away from the escarpment that it could still have moved several tens of kilometers since they were dated 45 million years ago. So I've, I've not yet seen a hard constraint that would really say that that escarpment has not moved. And of course, the, the laterites that are up on the plateau surface don't really tell us anything except that that surface is old and is not eroding. Good. Um, the next one from Kai Hu. Uh, how would the escarpment retreat be affected by cyclic sea level changes over geological time, tens of millions of years? Would a major sea level chain induce a wave of erosion sedimentation propagating upstream to the divide? It's possible, but I think it's unlikely because these uh, coastal plains are quite uh, long, you know, and they and they kind of buffer the escarpment from the from effects of sea level change, and they don't seem to show very much uh, evidence of, say. Uh, you know, repeated incision, deposition, nick points, and so on. They're, they're uh, uh, you know, and I, I, this is in part, I think, also because of this isostasy issue that we've raised, that because these coastal plain areas are constantly being uplifted a little bit, they tend to not, they tend to be bedrock. Uh, and so, but, uh, so I think that kind of uh, means it would take quite a bit of time for any sea level change effect to propagate you know, the 100 kilometers inland to where the escarpments are. So I don't think they affect the escarpment very much. They might affect the coastal region more. OK, so we'll go on to our next question by Yuan Shu Ma. Which would be faster between escarpment retreat and fluvial nick point retreat? Uh, an escarpment is essentially a nick point, but it's a very long nick point and it goes right up to the headwaters of the river where the nick point migration is, is very slow because of the small drainage area. But I think it, it, you know, in the absence of big river captures, it is essentially retreating at the same velocity as a fluvial nick point would move. 
Now, every time there's a capture, that accelerates. So you know, on average, it's going to move faster than a nick point would move in this part of the stream. But keep in, in mind that we're talking the upper reaches, so nick points tend to move quite slowly in the upper reaches of the river anyway. Okay, um, the next question is from Wolfgang Schwanghardt about your model. And the question is, what's the role of hill slope diffusion in your model? From the visualization, it seems like it's escarpments diffuse, which drives the mobility of the divide. However, most escarpments are formed by resistant rocks forming extremely steep walls and weathering limited slopes. Do you have escarpment retreat if diff diffusivity is set to zero? Well, we, we also have models where we use a threshold slope and not a diffusion. I'm not sure why you think that the escarpments are diffusing. I don't think, I mean, I, I don't think they're really diffusing. I, I think it's still dominated by fluvial incision, not by the diffusion. However, I will say that the uh, uh, divide migration velocities are dependent on that diffusivity or on if we use a threshold hill slope. So. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, Jean Braun did some similar work a couple of years ago. He had a paper I think I referenced somewhere in my talk from 2018. Uh, he found the same thing that at least in theory, but again, these are one dimensional theory models. I'm not sure I believe anymore. In theory, it does depend on that, that diffusivity. Uh, but yeah, even if we use a, you know, a threshold, you know, or a steep threshold condition, it's still going to be that fluvial incision. It's going to drive some divide migration. And once you get a capture, then that's a, then it's a new story. Then it's a new river and a nick point. Okay, so we've reached uh, our final question. Um, I had a follow-up question by Kai Deng following uh, Steffi's question. And if there is beryllium 10 sample on the plateau and another beryllium 10 sample just downstream of the escarpment, the erosion rate of the escarpment part can be calculated by subtraction using traditional horizontal area projection. Will this value be similar to that calculated using the new vertical projection method here? In fact, we tried to do something like that uh, in the we tried partitioning. So for some of these catchments that clearly have a plateau, now what we don't have is we don't have a sample at the edge of the escarpment, right? This, uh, uh, so we don't know exactly what the, uh, the contribution from the plateau area is, but we did do something where, uh, say we for Yan Yan here, she did do something where she estimated the erosion rate of the plateau, used that to calculate a down cutting rate for the plateau and then removed that material and beryllium 10 from the calculation for the back cutting of the escarpment. That's in her paper. If, was, if that wasn't clear, this the, the cosmogenic stuff is published in eSurf. Uh, and that's the, at least the preprint version is published and the uh, final version is accepted. And I think we're waiting just for the uh, typesetting phase now. So the final version will be out in weeks and the preprint is available now. So you can actually see that that calculation is in there. All right, um, I think this is it. I wanna thank everybody for joining us to our uh, first fall uh, talk of the series. And again, to thank Sean for his talk and um, we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much, everyone.